difference between Advaita Vedanta and Tibetan Buddhism. The language, the language in Advaita Vedanta can easily lead to the mistake of reification, Hmm. that there exist these entities, Atman, Brahman, you know, like things. Among many things in the world, there is this thing, or there's an ultimate thing. But that's not what Advaita Vedanta wants to say. And the language on the Tibetan Buddhist side, if you especially see the language of Chandrakirti and the, you know, like Tsongkhapa and others and more radical uh, of the Tibetan lamas later on, mm. the language can easily mislead us into thinking they were uh, uh, nihilists, that they are trying to say nothing exists. But that's the limitation of, of language. What Advaita Vedanta would want actually to say is that if you, see, if you think of, um, of a vast space, a limitless space, and lit up, you know, like vast blue sky, not just sky, but, but also uh, lit up. So the vastness, that emptiness would be pure being and uh, that lighting up aspect of it, that awareness aspect of it would be pure consciousness. That's the understanding of limitless being sat and limitless consciousness chit. Mm. A good way of understanding this difference would be from the Hindu side, a rival school of the Advaitins is called the Vishishta Advaitin, universe. Sentient beings, the worlds, and all of that, tiny particles, everything. It's more like a, a magical display, like a city. They use terms like a city of cl- in the clouds, a Gandharvanagar city in the clouds. Mm. Or the, a favorite for them is a dream analogy, or the you know classic, the rope mistaken for a snake. Yeah. So it's not that you know in a semi darkness somebody sees a rope and thinks it's a snake. It's not that the snake is a part of the rope. Or not that, uh, you know, there's a snake which merged in the rope when you became enlightened. No, there was no snake. It's the rope alone which looked like a snake. Yeah. Everything in a dream. It's like a virtual world. But all of that is not a part of the waking person. It's just the waking person's mind in a dream state appears as that uh, world, as that dream world. So exactly like that, because of Maya, the same existence, consciousness, bliss, you know, existence appears as existing things and consciousness is experienced as conscious experiences, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and so on and so forth. And the bliss aspect of it ap- appears as the pleasure and pain of this universe. But yeah, so it is the inner reality of this universe, you might say, or our own inner reality. If you like, there's one issue here, which I would like to go on to the sure. non-duality. How do you get from one consciousness to non-duality? Yeah, please build a bridge. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very important. You know, the uh, the first step in Advaita Vedanta is to appreciate that how we are not essentially not the body mind. Uh, we are this witness consciousness. But then the question arises. I mean, there's a, a secondary question here: of is there one witness consciousness or many? Because our intuitive feel would be that we are many people so there are many witness consciousnesses but then Advaita says that no there aren't there is one witness consciousness and there are arguments back and forth about this the Sankhyans hold that consciousness, pure consciousness also is many, there are multiple pure consciousnesses and Advaita says the way Advaita deals with it is it turns the question around and asks the Sankhyan why would you distinguish pure consciousness from pure consciousness and you can clearly distinguish a body from a body you can distinguish minds from each other. But mm-hmm. you can't distinguish consciousness from bare consciousness, minus body, mind, or minus any particulars. So that's how Advaita Vedanta wants to say that there is one underlying consciousness. But the more imp- interesting question is, what is the relationship between consciousness and that which consciousness experiences? And here, I'll give like five, very quickly, Five answers to this, which you see broadly find in Indian thought. Uh, one is the materialist answer, very much so in, in tune with the modern materialist reductionist and all, you know. So the materialist answer would be consciousness is secondary. It's, it's matter. It's the objective universe, which is primary, and consciousness emerges from the objective universe. They actually said that thousands of years back, and mm. they said consciousness is a product of things which is going on in the body. The second answer would be that consciousness is primary and the material universe emerges from consciousness. And contrary to what one might think, this is not Advaita. This is actually the theistic religions of the world, including Hinduism. Uh, They say God created the universe. I mean, one common idea of God in all the theistic traditions is God is the creator of the universe. And presumably, the Advaitin says, 
God is supposed to be conscious, right? So in that case, you are saying consciousness created this universe. That's the second answer. And there are big problems with each answer. Mm -hmm. Then there is the third answer, the Sankhyan answer. And also I would say panpsychism of the kind David Chalmers says it could be possible hmm. that neither created the other. They are all fundamental realities. The material universe, time, space, and all of that is fundamental reality. And so is consciousness. And consciousness hmm. is ubiquitous. And they somehow interact. So that was the third answer. The Sankhyan school and the Patanjali yoga school, they held this. So we are beings of pure consciousness, but we have we are interacting with the material universe. We are interacting with bodies and minds. Then there is the fourth answer, which would be, say, the, um, the Madhyamaka answer, which says both of them, consciousness and you know, the appearances in consciousness, they are dependent on each other. They are, neither of them are ultimate realities. They are empty. Chandrakirti gives an example, which the Advaitin would never give. The example is of two sh bales of hay, you know, nice uh, tied, and two bales of hay leaning against each other. Mm. And if you pull out one, the other one goes. Right. So uh, when the Advaitin would say that consciousness is always there, even, even when the uh, objects of consciousness do not appear. So for example, in deep sleep, that's the uh, bone of contention. Mm -hmm. So uh, Advaitins would say in deep sleep, or today we might ask what about coma or, or anesthesia? That seems to be an interruption in consciousness. And the uh, Madhyamaka, the Chandrakirti, they would, they would agree. They said, you see, your precious consciousness is gone. When you don't have an object of consciousness, you're not, there's no, at least there's no experience of consciousness at all. And then there is the fifth answer, which is the Advaitic answer, which says that uh, the entire material universe is an appearance in consciousness and not distinct from consciousness. So the mind is the first appearance in consciousness and the sensory senses and the body and the external universe, all of them appear in consciousness and they are nothing but consciousness appearing to itself. In that sense, non-duality, that there is no countable second apart from that bare consciousness. Mm. And yet, even after this understanding, the world goes on exactly as it is. What is the nature of this one unlimited pure being? The Advaitin would say exactly what you're experiencing now. This is that one pure uh, being, unlimited awareness existence. Mm. So this is how the Advaitins establish this non-dual, non-duality of being or consciousness. They are they take them interchangeably, pure being and pure awareness. I think mm. this has the advantage, multiple advantages. One is this is a pretty good way of, you know, phenomenologically describing in a deep way what is our experience right now. Mm. Second, it does not run counter to science. It, it allows for scientific thought and understanding and discovery. I mean, one, one good question is sometimes that, so if everything is in consciousness, then how do things exist apart from consciousness? So here, Advaita Vedanta makes a clear distinction between consciousness and knowing. That's why the distinction between consciousness and mind is important. Would you like me to go into this a, a little bit? Uh, sure. I, I think I should just say where uh, where my own intuitions run here, because I I think uh, it sounded like you you landed on this distinction in the end. You know, I, I think that final variant, the the Advaitic one, the the fifth one as a matter of phenomenology, makes perfect sense. I think you can be agnostic with respect to the metaphysics. You cannot make any claims about how consciousness relates to the physical universe or the, you know, the, even the physical brain. You can be uncertain as to at what point it arises in nature or whether it does arise or you know, how, you know, how it relates to the physics of things. But you can recognize that as a matter of experience, there is only consciousness and its modifications, right? And, e and even your experience of being a, you know, whatever you're calling the physical world and your physical body in that physical world, all of that is appearing to you as a modification of consciousness. And that is, that's the only option, whatever the metaphysics. And uh, so I, I, for me, just as, as an intellectual matter, I tend to just bracket all questions of a third person view of consciousness for a kind of a separate discussion. And I, I, I think the, you know, we're genuine, as, as a matter of science, we're, we're genuinely uncertain about 
all of that. I, you know, you mentioned David Chalmers. I think the hard problem of of consciousness is is truly hard and and still with us. But as a matter of experience, everything we're saying about the illusoriness of the self and the nature of emptiness and and its recognizability and its availability, even in ordinary states of consciousness, all all of that. I think is empirically, phenomenologically true, uh, and we can bracket the metaphysics and and the and the third person aspects to this. I I would agree with you. We have this uh, very senior member of the Vedanta Society here, an empty room. At which point have we stepped outside consciousness? And is it at all possible to step outside consciousness? You can't. <laughs> uh, so. That's what it means. I mean, here there's a very important distinction between consciousness and mind. So what Advaita would say is that it's quite possible that everything is in consciousness, but then it neatly divides into something which is known and a vast unknown. So to know things, even if everything is within consciousness, to know something, you need to deploy instruments of knowledge like senses and science and whatever, whatever way we all know things. Otherwise, although everything is in consciousness, it would appear as a blank unknown. So that's where I think that's what makes science or Advaita compatible with the scientific search and it would not come into contradiction at any point. Science is using the same consciousness, powered by the same consciousness. We use uh, scientific, our, our senses and machinery and scientific methodologies to you know, gain access to the unknown and make it known, all within the same consciousness. Yeah, I, I I think there would be a contradiction for for people who are taking the the Advaitic metaphysics as their focus. There's a potential contradiction to take one possible scientific solution to the the, the hard problem, uh, or at least a solution to the the question of what is the status of consciousness, whether this can be intuitively satisfying or not. It just may be the case that consciousness only arises in you know, certain complex systems that process information in certain ways and, and and only parts of the human brain qualify as such systems so it just may be true to say that there there is a neural correlate of consciousness uh, we don't fully understand it yet but it's not the whole brain it's just parts of the brain in certain states that produce everything we're talking about the, the physical substrate for everything we're talking about subjectively and this has certain implications. It, it, one, it might have the implication that you could do this in other systems because it really is just a, a matter of the functional integration and, and information processing of these systems. It's not a matter of it being in a computer made of meat. So we could build conscious computers, uh, and we, we may in fact do that. And it also suggests that when people die, consciousness really is extinguished, right? So there is a a hierarchy where the you know the the physical materialist reality is governs the subjective conscious reality in ways that are counterintuitive but just may in fact be real and so when you're dead you're really dead and any expectation of uh, future lives makes no sense on that account um although i would i would say as a there's a section in in waking up, where I discuss the the views of uh, this philosopher Tom Clark, which uh, give a, a kind of materialist picture of rebirth, essentially that is it, pretty interesting. Uh, I would leave that aside for a moment. But in any case, it, it, there's a possible contradiction there. But th I don't see any contradiction if you emphasize the phenomenological em empirical side, which is we. This is what first person experience is like if you pay sufficient attention to it. And in fact, there it brings experience into closer conformity with what we have every reason to believe scientifically about the nature of, of mind and its relationship to the brain. I mean, for instance, there's no way to make sense of the ego in neurophysiological terms. I mean, it's just, it, there's no place in the brain where you, where you can detect the existence of an ego nor would it be plausible for there to be an unchanging self in the middle of, of the brain in any way, given what the brain is doing and given how its, its states change. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's where I tend to leave it. It's not that the, those other questions are, are uninteresting. I just think they're currently unresolvable 
And yeah, and, and yet the, the, the important part of, you know, suffering and the end of suffering uh, and cutting through the illusions that keep us on the, the uh, suffering side of that continuum, uh, that, that can be solved and it can be solved very directly. Yes. I, I personally think that the hard problem of consciousness is very significant. But uh, having said that, my personal attitude to this whole question of uh, science and Advaita or Buddhism is, you know, to be fairly relaxed about it in the sense of know the systems very well, but don't hold on to the systems too tightly and keep mm -hmm. an uh, open eye for developments and be comfortable with uh, ready to change. Sometimes from from our side, the Vedantic side, or from spiritual seekers, we have this question that these systems are complete in themselves. They are ancient systems, Advaita or Tibetan Buddhism, and they have arguably taken thousands of people over the centuries to moksha or nirvana or enlightenment. So why do we need to have a discussion with, with, about, with, about science at all in these uh, realms? Uh, and I say that it's good to have a discussion about science because first of all, uh, my sense of the people who, uh, who were pioneers in these systems, all the way from, down back to the Buddha or you know, Adi Shankara and other the Vedic rishis, the kind of minds I see in their writings and their teachings, they would be interested. They would be very interested in mm -hmm. developments in science. And the second is, like it or not, we live in a world of science and we have been brought up to think from a school days in a sort of generally scientific framework. I don't think one can reasonably or one even ought to leave out science and scientific thinking even in one's spiritual pursuit. Yeah, you can engage the phenomenological side very much in the spirit of science. I mean, really what we're suggesting is a, is a methodology by which one can confirm various hypotheses. And it's never a matter of taking any of these claims on faith. It's just a matter of being, I mean, if there's a modicum of faith here, it's just the faith that you individually can look into it for yourself that you're not cursed in some kind of unique, you know, outer darkness where you, where these facts, if they exist to be seen, are unavailable to you, right? It's like, you know, can you notice, and, you know, like the, the claim, to take a very simple claim, thoughts are impermanent, you know, thoughts arise and then they pass away, right? And, and, and emotions are impermanent, you know, an emotion like anger appears, but then it eventually fades away. This is an empirical claim about the nature of one uh, of subjectivity, and it's a universal claim. It's a claim I'm making not just about myself, but about any listener. But a, a listener looking into this for the first time can say, "Well, is is that true? I'm, I don't need to take that on faith. Let me see." And those are facts that uh, about a person's mind that are there to be seen. And you know, the, really, the only thing to take on faith is that. It's not a complete waste of time to look. If you want to know more about what it's like to be you, you know, it makes sense to pay more attention. That really is the, the only necessary starting point for this kind of inquiry. Right. In Advaita Vedanta, one of the prerequisites for being a student is uh, Shraddha. So Shraddha is a Sanskrit mm. word which can be translated as faith. And immediately people say, oh, here too you need faith, but, but didn't you say that... Uh, it's the path of devotional religion, which is faith-based, and here you don't need faith. And the way I explain it is exactly what you said, that uh, the only kind of faith you require here is the faith that there is something worthwhile here, something mm. worthwhile inquiring, something enormously useful to us if we would just stop and look. And at no point are you asked to take anything on, on you know, just as belief, as unverifiable or belief. In fact, Advaita Vedanta insists that at every step we must stop and see whether I understand it correctly and also check that whether it seems real to me, whether it is a lived fact. And that's the only way to go forward. Because in Advaita Vedanta, very soon, if you just read a text, very soon we'll be in the realm of what seems to be pure speculation or metaphysics. But the remarkable thing about Advaita Vedanta is that it is actually it's actually a phenomenological inquiry. At every mm -hmm. point, it's dealing with something directly available to us all the time. So uh, how do you think about freedom at this point? How do you think about what remains when you bring this path 
to something like you know full maturity. You know, there are many people who understand exactly what we're talking about and and experience it, and they're so they're practicing, but they have relinquished any image of of final enlightenment as somehow being either unattainable or unrealistic or just dangerous to entertain because there have been there's so many examples of obviously awakened teachers who who have contributed to the, the spiritual lives of many people but have also behaved terribly in their roles as gurus and created immense harm right so they're not they're not pure frauds many of these teachers but based on perhaps a delusion of their own perfection or the, the the systems of thought in which they were put at the top of a hierarchy and treated like you know living buddhas they got drunk on their power and behaved in ways that are indefensible so you know many smart people who are who have uh, followed us this far in the conversation nevertheless have decided that there's kind of a perpetual incompleteness to the path, you know, there's really only just it's a path of endless new beginnings, but there's no final terminus, right? There's no place at which you can f- say that you fully stabilized this intuition into non-duality. Say, right? This is going to be a, you know, they're they're not expecting anything other than a perpetual vacillation between the wisdom of emptiness and being taken in again, taken in once again by the illusion of duality, right? Like the, they, they keep falling back asleep and dreaming again and then waking up. And um, that describes my experience, certainly, but I haven't relinquished an image, at least, of the possibility of actually never being taken in by the illusion again. I mean, just what, the, the, the reality of, of emptiness becomes so obvious that it becomes impossible to overlook. And there's an image I, I like, especially from the Tibetan tradition of the different stages of the liberation of thought. And the, I believe the first stage is like a, you know, a writing on water, right? You know, you, you no sooner do you trace a letter on on the surface of water that it begins to vanish. And that's it. So at, at a certain stage of practice, thoughts arise in that way. Uh, and then the second stage is uh, a snake you know, untying itself from a knot. You know, thoughts liberate themselves, uh, you know, of their own accord. Uh, and then finally, and this is the image I actually really like, in the final stage, thoughts are like thieves entering an empty house. There's nothing for them to steal, right? There's just, there's no problem with thieves in an empty house. And in the end, you know, the arising of thoughts will will never for a moment imply a dualistic separate self that is encumbered by thoughts. And there's nothing to be liberated. There's nothing to be meditated upon. There's no possibility of distraction. There's just reality, again, from the phenomenological side. And yet, I would say most of the teachers I've spoken with have tended to give up a picture of, of a final uh, accomplishment here, a final state. You know, the, the, uh, you know, everyone. He loves the concept of awakening now, but not too many people are thinking about full enlightenment. I'm wondering where you, you come down on that question. Yes. I noticed you used the word stabilized. And it's interesting that Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, he asks Krishna, after Krishna tells him about the real nature of the Atman, uh, he asks the question, so what is it like to be a person of stabilized wisdom? He uses the mm-hmm. Sanskrit word sthita pragya. Pragya means consciousness uh, or wisdom, mm-hmm. uh, enlightenment. And sthita means stabilized, stabilized enlightenment. Mm. So this problem was uh, recognized long ago. I think it in the Buddhist tradition, very, very well recognized. And also in the Advaita Vedanta tradition, there are books on it. And the conclusion, I think, definitely from the Advaita side and also from the Buddhist side, as far as I know, is that it is possible to be a being of stabilized wisdom, to be fully enlightened and manifesting that enlightenment in this life. Uh, The goal in Advaita Vedanta is called Jivan Mukti. Mm. Jivan means living. Mukti means liberation, living liberation. So you're still, for all practical purposes, embodied in this body. You have the same old mind. 
but you realize what you truly are and everybody else and everything else truly is. And then you continue to live the life as it was. But then you bring uh, an extraordinary quality of enlightenment to that life. Now, this question of a final attainment, Advaita's answer would be the final attainment is already there. Mm -hmm. In Sanskrit, they call it praptasya prapti, attaining what you have attained. And nivrittasya nivritti, that means what is given up, solved, dismissed is something that was never there, a problem that never existed. And that sounds, <laughs> uh, but, but that makes very good sense from the perspective of, you know, pure consciousness. So you are this pure consciousness right now. I remember this monk in the Himalayas who would often say, in Hindi, he would say this, what he meant, what he said was, whether you know it or you do not know it, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, you are Rama. That means you are God. <laughs> so it is an attainment of something already attained and choicelessly attained. You can't not attain it. Mm. So it's always there. Yet the problem is not, uh, not an invalid problem. It's what one might call an advanced problem. It's not a problem of the beginner. It's the problem of the person who begins to see for the first time that uh, meditation and inquiry begins to reveal one catches glimpses of what one, one truly is or what is the nature of things. Then this question arises that I see what you are saying. I get it also. But the thing is, I can't live it. And there seem to be a number of gurus and teachers who also can't seem to live it consistently also. So what's going wrong here? So there is a, one entire book about this called Jivan Mukti Viveka by the same Vidyaranya Swami whose book I quoted earlier, Drig Drishya Viveka. The Jivan Mukti Viveka is an, uh, is an analysis or an inquiry into the nature of uh, living liberation. Hmm. His basic thesis is that uh, this full-blown liberation consists of three components. One is what we call enlightenment. In Sanskrit, tattva jnana, knowledge of reality or realization of the reality. This is what we call, what, what persons might say that, I've seen it or I get it. It's clear to me. So that's only one component of the uh, requirement. So you are enlightened if you, if you see that. But there are two more components. The next component is called vasanakshaya, purification of mind. Literally, it means destructions of uh, past impression or, or purification of past impressions. And the third component is manonasha. It's uh, literally... It means destruction of the mind, which is ominous, but it, all it means is the ability to plunge the mind into deep meditation. Uh, I mean, a very thorough, advanced training in meditation, in samadhi, basically. Mm. So, according to this text, full liberation, full-blown liberation, living it in this life, would uh, have these three components. One is, of course, you must know the truth, that I am Atman, Brahman, or I am pure consciousness. That's the real nature of myself and everything else also. So this is, becomes a vivid, clear realization beyond doubt and absolute clarity about this. Then the second one would be impurities. The impure mind must be converted into a pure mind. This impure mind is the result of conditioning in this life and if you believe in past lives, in multiple lifetimes. And how do you do this? This requires the hard work, the drudgery of a determined ethical life. Mm. Trying to manifest this enlightenment realization through a moral life, a strictly moral life. And the third one is training in meditation so that you don't get swept up. The mind doesn't get swept away again and again. You can focus on the reality and stay there, stay with it in samadhi. When one has all three developed, that's full-blown enlightenment. And such a person would not slip morally, would not, be, would not commit ethical blunders. Mm. Now, one point he makes is, here, this idea of a progressive path and direct realization. He says, those who have been on a progressive path, and he calls it Krito Upasti, who have performed the entire course of spiritual practices. For them, when enlightenment comes, it's full blown enlightenment, it's full blown liberation, because the other, the basic groundwork has already been done. Mm. But for others, some might stumble on this, some might uh, inquire deeply into it and get a flash of a glimpse of this reality. But the other components have not been developed yet. So for them, what is recommended is don't become a guru. Don't go on a lecture tour or start writing books. Mm -hmm. Intensify uh, spiritual practices. 
What spiritual practices? The same old stuff which you were doing earlier. Strictly moral life, self-restraint, and uh, deepen your meditation. No longer in search of a truth. You already found it. Mm. But to stay there, to stay with it, and to see, ultimately, it's not, you're not really, you don't even have to stay there. You are choicelessly there anyway, and it's mm. all right. I love those three examples you gave. The writing, the thoughts are first like writing water on, uh, like writing words on flowing water, and then a snake uncoiling itself, and then thieves in an empty house. I'll, with your permission, I'll borrow them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forget the origin of that. It, it appears in the Dzogchen teachings, but it, I don't know if it's Padmasambhava or uh, Longchenpa, or I'll, I'll try to track it down for you. Swamiji, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I, I love where we arrived. I, and um, remind me, what, what was the name of the book? Uh, that you uh, just recommended on uh, embodying the enlightened life, the uh, it's um, Jivan Mukta Viveka or something? Jivan Mukti Viveka, published by Advaita Ashrama, translated by Swami Mokshadananda. Mm. I can send it to yeah, the no, team. I, no, I'll, I will uh, happily purchase it. Wonderful to get your voice here, Swamiji. Uh, I hope it's the first of many conversations. Absolutely, Sam. And you have a standing invitation to visit us here at the Vedanta nice. Society, the congregation here, they are familiar with you. They're very familiar because I on and off keep quoting you. So Nice, nice. Well, we'll, we'll do that. I'd love to do that.